Welcome to Mapperton, our family home and estate in Dorset in the southwest of England. Julie and I took over running Mapperton a few years ago from my parents, the Earl and Countess of Sandwich. It's a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. This place is full of fascinating stories, extraordinary people, and endless repairs. So please join our family on this journey of a lifetime as we put all our efforts into preserving this magnificent part of England's heritage. Come on in and see the hall, which is um, mainly Civil War period, so early 17th century. There's a group of family portraits, really quite unique, that so many have survived in the family. And I'll introduce you to all the members of the family. And starting with the one we call the progenitor, the Lord Montague of Boughton House, which is really the, the mother house of the Montague family in Northamptonshire. And he was the Sir Edward Montague, who was loyal to James I. So he was, he was somewhat put out when his son decided to fight in the Civil War. He was decorated by the king, but then he was also put in the tower by the Republicans, which was pretty unpleasant. Um, he's, his claim to fame is that he was the inventor of the fireworks celebration every year on November the 5th, the time when Guy Fawkes tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament. And we commemorate the fact that he didn't succeed. So an important contribution. Um, he had six sons and the, the youngest, Sidney, was the father of the first Earl. And I'll take you to see the first Earl of Sandwich over here. And this is Edward Montague, young Cromwellian soldier, very young, I mean, he was 17, 18, and he was about to inherit the proper family home at Hinchingbrook. So Edward goes back to the beginning of the Civil War, and he had a young cousin, Samuel Pepys, who grew up in Huntingdon, and so did Cromwell. They all went to the grammar school in Huntingdon, which is still there today. But Edward was very cunning in the sense that he anticipated what was going to happen at the end of the period of Cromwell's rule. And there was a time after Cromwell's death when the, the army was really in charge, the, the whole the whole of England was in a state of chaos. And it was only then that the monarchy was able to re return. And it was Edward who was chosen to go and collect King Charles II in May 1660. And that was his story. But of course, I mustn't leave out his wife, Jemima. Jemima Crewe. So we'll just go and see Jemima in this portrait, which is also by Lily, And uh, she was a, quite a figure. Um, you have to read Samuel Pepys's diary to really understand her. She was one of the most considerate women um, in Pepys's life. And she was always giving him advice about being kind to his wife, because we remember Samuel Pepys was not a, a sort of model of husband. Um, and so she used to say, you know, why don't you give her a pair of gloves after that incident the other day? And so there are many stories of, of Jemima which have been well recorded. And she obviously took great care of herself, as you can see in this portrait, and of her children, I mean, remarkably, she had 10 children who all survived to adulthood, which was quite unusual at that time. 
Um, this room is really uh, a late 17th century room. A Richard Broderick of the time took down the Morgan Hall, the 16th century hall, um, and the dining room, and put in a smarter sort of 1670s, 1680s hall with much bigger windows like this um, and much sort of grander. Uh, the Brodrips were kind of county gentry and they clearly had to keep up with their friends. This room is one of their uh, achievements. In fact, over there, um, there's um, a rather heavy arch, which is probably 1630s. What I think happened is that they started refurbing the house in the 1630s, and then the Civil War came along, and they simply stopped and took it up again in the 1670s. And we think this, this panelling all the way around here is um, 1670s, late 17th century panelling, running along here and along here, and then actually into the little hall there. Because this wall here, this little wall here, was put in by Mrs. Labouchere to take the cold out of the hall by blocking off the front door. It, it works to keep the room warm. That's the basic architecture of this room and onto this architecture has been imposed in the last 200 years three different things. The ceiling here uh, was put in by Mrs. Labouchere, uh, arts and crafts, winged horse of Pegasus with some, I think probably hops, very typical 1910s, 1920s designs. I personally don't think that these beams are wood, I think they're rolled steel joists because there are rolled steel joists all over the house. And indeed, once when I had, to, had a leak in my, our bedroom and I had to crawl up into the roof to uh, stop the leak, I stubbed, as I crawled through the eaves, I stubbed my knee on a rolled steel joist and was very relieved and pleased to know that Mrs. Labouchere had really done such a good job when she restored the house in the 1920s, having turned it into a building site, basically. And this, this huge overmantel comes from the Paulet time at Melplash and shows the arms of the Marquis of Winchester, which was the Paulet title, and is dated 1604. The third um, piece of plaster imposition is a reproduction of a very small part of the frieze from the Temple of Bassi in the Peloponnese, and it shows Amazon women being defeated by Greek men, which is incredibly irritating. Often when I'm taking tours around, I say this to people and I see women looking really quite put out by it. Shall we talk about this table? Yeah, because absolutely. It's, it's a really wonderful Tuscan table. It comes from the same period as the hall and you can see how much carving and decoration there is in it. Completely uh, mysterious to me as to how it came into the family, uh, but that is the case with so many of these collections. You don't ask, you admire. Hey John, what about all these grandchildren and oh, great yes. nephews and all? And they go Nancy, William, Walter, Wilf, Sam, Cecily, Lettuce, Leo, and Nesta. Correct. <laughs> now, why don't you tell the story on the way to the plant? Oh, okay, we're going the to the plant. Um, this picture here of the great progenitor, Lord Montague of Boughton, um, his hands are so awful and look like dead fish that I've always put a plant in front so that you never quite see the hands. And in fact, that plant's a bit small. I need to put a really large plant in there <laughs> so you can't see his hands at all. We call this grandfather clock the Nib because it was made by Johannes Nib, a famous family of horologists in the 17th century. I think we, we don't have the exact date. But um, what I thought I would do is wind the clock, which is quite complicated. I have to take the case off over there and put it down somewhere safe. I wind the clock. And this is the, the clock that is wound backwards, don't ask me why. 
it's also uh, the only clock that keeps proper time. Every other clock goes fun, fast or slow. And this gives me much more confidence once it's done. Very, I very rarely touch the pendulum, whereas you have to adjust pendulum on most clocks. It goes on for a month, so that's particularly good that it keeps time. We're very lucky to We're very lucky that. to have that. Is there anything else we can show? Oh yes, there's your family cabinet over there. Right, okay. Uh, this large piece of furniture here it has always been in my family and it's called the bug cabinet and I'll show you why. Got a lot of treasures Bugs. inside. Actually, some very beautiful butterflies, not English butterflies. Locusts, and then beetles in abundance, including scarabs. Um, okay. And then the bowl up there, which is from John's family, is uh, Chinese export ware from the 18th century. It's called Chen Lung. And well, maybe this, I should turn it round slowly so people can see. And this bowl is Masonic. It's got the Masonic symbols on it. I call it the Masonic punch bowl. It is a Masonic punch, yeah. But we haven't actually used it for punch. Well, we could do that. So far. We could do that for lunch today, Jean. It did get punctured once, though, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> it used to be in my father-in-law's bedroom on the windowsill just where he drew his curtains and he drew his curtains using his walking stick. One time he got a bit too energetic and dug a little tiny hole with his walking stick just like that and it was mended by a very fine um, china mender in London and has kept its ring and I can't even see where it is, the mend. Well, I could. So. Yeah, maybe. Well, I think we've covered the whole room, haven't we? More or less. We might move to another room. I think right. we've, yes, we've done that. Should we go on in? Yeah. If you are enjoying this episode, please consider supporting this important part of England's heritage by becoming a patron at mappertonlive.com. This is the library, as you can see, and I want to show you the portrait of the first Earl just before he's created an Earl of Sandwich, because he's at the height of his power in the Cromwellian Navy. Um, this painting by John Michael Wright shows him in Cromwellian Republican colours. And he was the second admiral, but Admiral Blake died. So he became the premier admiral of England just before the restoration. And this was a time of great turmoil when the army was giving all the instructions and the navy had to follow. There was always this kind of problem. Um, Oliver Cromwell died in 1658. His rather sort of wet son, Richard, took over and it wasn't going to be any good at all. And basically the City of London, the merchants of the City of London thought it was time to bring back strong government in the form of a monarchy. And Sandwich, sorry, Edward Montague and Albemarle, who was not called Albemarle by then, of course called Monk, General, Ge Monk. General Monk, were in correspondence saying, hey, don't you think it's time we brought the king back? And together they agreed and the City of London which was an extremely important political as well as trading entity, uh, agreed. And off they went, off Edward Montague went with Samuel Pepys to Holland to collect the king. And over here we have um, Sandwich's own journal recording this famous event of the, the king, King Charles II, being restored to his throne. And Pepys' um, description is really much more informal. Sandwich is concerned about the names of the ships and the famous royalty from all over Europe who attended. Um, when you look at Samuel Pepys, um, he describes the king 
where it made me ready to weep to hear the stories that he told of his difficulties passed through, travelling four days and three nights on foot, every step up to his knees in dirt with nothing but a green coat. This was describing King Charles escaping from the Battle of Worcester away from the Cromwellians. Um, and there's a wonderful description of the dog leaving a mess somewhere in the boat, you know, these sort of details. And I think I must read just a little bit of the diary of Samuel Pepys. In the morning come infinity of people on board from the king to go along with him. My lord, Mr. Crewe and others go on shore to meet the king as he comes off from shore, where Sir, Sir R. Stainer bringing his majesty into the boat. I hear that his majesty did with a great deal of affection kiss my lord upon his first meeting. So it, it goes on like that, infinite shooting off of guns and that in a disorder on purpose, which was better than it had, if it had been done otherwise. It's a very familiar vernacular when, when Pepys is writing, whereas the, the first L on the same day wrote um, a record of this great event. But it's all about the personages and the people coming on board. And there was no um, story like Pepys tells the story of the king's escape from Worcester and all sorts of things he was picking up. So he was more of the journalist, whereas this was the, the admiral. And this is a, a man of war, one, what they used to call a first rate, um, 90 guns, the kind of ship that Samuel Pepys was organizing as the clerk to the Navy board. And these models were commemoration models, but they were originally used before they were decorated to show the Admiralty or the Navy Board what they were in for and how much it would cost and how many hundred men would be needed. Um, it's said that this is called the sandwich, but we don't have a, a genuine record, but it will have been in the first Earl's own collection, and Samuel Pepys would have known this model. In his journal is a most amazing collection of drawings. So we have here a drawing of the grinder, the man who has a, a, an enormous um, roller. A roller with, with which he's rolling the raw chocolate. And then later on, um, the, the um, numerous recipes include one, let's see where it is. No, I think it's up there. And I'll just read it quickly. Prepare ye chocolatey, and then put ye vessel that hath ye chocolatey in it into a carafa of snow, stirred together with some salt, and shake ye snow together some time, and it will put ye chocolatey into tender curled ice. And so eat it with spoons, and eat also Naples biscuit along with it. This way is much used for pleasure in ye heat of summer, but is held unwholesome, and one is obliged for better security to drink hot chocolatey in a quarter of an hour after. And actually, Johnny, we went to Hampton Court, didn't we? And where there is a chocolate... Um, There's a room kitchen, devoted to chocolate, chocolate making. Kitchen. Yes. And we saw them making chocolate in this traditional way with rollers. It's still and happening. And we took our grandson there to see it, so he'd know how to make chocolate in the future, according to the first Earl. Now, do you think we should b mention this chair? Because that's well, rather important if you want. in the story. Yes, of course. Um, the Dutch Burgomaster's <laughs> chair on which the king is said to have sat on the Royal Charles on his way home. But... but <laughs> um, you know the way families have these myths and traditions, and they're lovely and they have their own veracity, I guess, um, but actually this chair is 18th century Indonesian and is illustrated in the classic book on Indonesian furniture. But I think we still say it's said to be 
Now, well, some of us, got some of us do and some of us don't. <laughs> <laughs> so over here we have the Declaration of Breeder, or a copy of, which was the Declaration of Loyalty of the Navy and of the Army to the new king. And I think, um, yes, it's got the signature of Charles, Charles Rex on the top. And uh, the title is to Sandwich and Albemarle. So they were the ones who were concerned with the, the Navy, the senior commanders. This was an important document because it was the turning point from the Cromwellian Navy to the Restoration Navy where although the country had been some chaos, it was the moment when all the eyes were, as it were, turned towards Charles and uh, the loyalty of the Navy was no longer in dispute. To continue following our journey here at Britain's finest manor house, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. What happened really in the 18th century was that um, the, uh, these Brodericks, whom I keep talking about, decided to uh, change this end of the house entirely and put on a classical facade and make it look like a, a, an 18th century house. And as a result, they had to chop these two rooms, make them shorter, curtail them, cut them back. And so when they, having cut it back, where no doubt it had a 16th century ceiling, they put in this beautiful Rococo ceiling, really lovely. It's a very typical uh, ceiling of the contractors that they were using. I've seen exactly this design in another house on the walls. Very interesting. Uh, this is the second overmantel that was taken from Melplage Court um, and again was a Paulet uh, overmantel. It's the arms of James I of England, James VI of Scotland, and the two bearers are very, very clearly the green man and the green woman. I mean, you can see that he's got, she's a real woman, she's got breasts, um, and he's got a beard, it's extraordinary. And then, the, of course, it's above this lovely 16th century fireplace. Shall we go and look at the sure. painting you, in the yeah. corner? So tucked away here is a, a very fine painting of one of the children of the fourth Earl of Sandwich, uh, who was unfortunately very ill at the age of seven, probably. Um, we, do we know why he died? No, no. But um, they all had similar things, like a pneumonia. Anyway, he was Edward, who died when he was only seven, probably of consumption. Don't know why you say that. It could be anything. They all died like flies, the children in the 18th century well, yeah. and the 17th and all. All periods really before the middle of the 19th. What we don't know is whether it was painted before or after he died. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And, uh, but he has a wonderful glowing look and, and a russet coloured coat. And uh, he was um, one of the five children, who, uh, only one of whom survived uh, as... Um, and became the fifth Earl of Sandwich. Hogarth was obviously one of the 18th century's most important painters. I mean, he was important both for his portraits, which were wonderful and very real and alive. And there's a marvellous self-portrait of his in the, it's either in the National Gallery or the National Portrait Gallery, I can't remember. And then, of course, he was a satirist and he did uh, lots of sequences of satire on weddings and, uh, and the um, ridiculous um, rites and passages of society, of which we actually, alas, don't have any. And he lived in a rather nice little 18th century house just near the a M4, little tiny house which is now caught between a motorway and a, and a, and a industrial block. Poor Hogarth, just next to Chiswick House, which he must have visited so often. Having looked at the Hogarth portrait and regretting that we don't have any Hogarth uh, satire, we do have some satirical pictures by Gilray, who must have been a contemporary of um, uh, Hogarth. John, are you going to talk about the two of your uh, two well, I mean, yes, satires this, 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 by... This is a, 
a, a scrap album, if you like, that's been in the family all this time. Um, Gill rays have now become rather valuable, so we have to keep keep them quietly in a corner. But they they show normally picture paintings, caricatures of politicians, notably William Pitt and Charles James Fox, and that is where, and George the Third, yeah. uh, look, and of course King George the Third, and. I think we, we can also see one um, of Na is Napoleon. This, isn't because, this Napoleon and yes. who? Pitt or Fox dividing up the world? It'll be Pitt in that case. Pitt yes. dividing up the world like, as then, a plum pudding. And then coming across here, <laughs> a cartoon which connects with the family. It's called Dainty Sandwich Carrots. And there's, there's a, a portrait of a, a market girl wheeling a lot of carrots away and um, perhaps the fifth Earl of Sandwich by that time uh, was, the, was the subject, um, obviously with uh, erotic intentions. And then you have a, a rather more sedate drawing of Lord Sandwich again. I think the date puts it after the fourth Earl. Really? No, wait a minute, no, I'm wrong. No, no, it's the fourth half. It's, it's, just, it. it's just inside his life, 1788. So he was only four years from the end. And he had a, a girl on either side, so... Sandwich? The cartoon is a sandwich. And behind us we have the family collection, um, which is in fact in two rooms, in the drawing room and in the library, of bound volumes. I mean, what they could all do with is some TLC in the form of a bit of cleaning and a little bit of um, leather, leather polish and all that sort of stuff. You know, I think you asked me, didn't you, about maintenance in a house like this? Well, there's maintenance of every sort. And there's furniture that I've seen even today that could do with some TLC. The books could. I think the ceiling looks all right. I don't think it needs repainting <laughs> at the moment. Um, well, it could do with a bit of repainting up there. But there's always stuff to do, and the carpets then get holes in them, and moth comes in and rust corrupts and all that stuff. Cut. <laughs> <laughs>